So today's podcast is going to be about Russia's new hypersonic Zircon missile. This is from RT here. Uh, they successfully tested it. It was flying eight times the speed of sound. It hit a ground-based target. They said that uh, the test was a 350 kilometer range test. And I'm going to play some footage of it. It was launched from a ship here in these vertical missile tubes. And it just goes straight up and it takes off and it goes up to Mach 8, which is about 10,000 kilometers per hour. And you can see it here taken off. And so that's these hypersonic missiles that we kept hearing about. Well, here, here they are. And so one ship can have multiple missiles on it and you would have multiple ships with these missiles on them. And what the whole point of this is that traveling at 10,000 kilometers per hour at Mach 8, eight times the speed of sound, this means that when you see it on radar, it's coming so fast that you barely have any time at all to react to it. And uh, just to give you a point of reference, um, 10,000 kilometers per hour, this is a fact sheet from NATO about the Patriot missile system. And these can fly up to 5,000 kilometers per hour. So about half as fast as a Zircon hypersonic missile. So this would have no chance of catching up to a Zircon missile. But uh, the other option that you have is if you're able to detect it soon enough and you're able to react fast enough, you might be able to send some sort of defense up ahead of it to kind of intercept this missile. And that's what uh, these next two articles, and I'm going to put the links to all of these in the video description below. In case you're interested in this, you can read all about it. This is from military.com. They're talking about why Russia's hypersonic missiles can't be seen on radar. And what they're talking about is because of the speed, because of the speed and the air pressure in front of it, it creates a plasma cloud and this absorbs radio waves making it practically invisible to active radar systems. Now, just think about it. When a crewed spacecraft comes back through the atmosphere, returning to Earth, it's going so fast, the heat around it builds up and you get a cloud of plasma around it, basically kind of the same thing that military.com is describing. And you get that communication blackout because the radio waves cannot go through and they cannot come out. And so it's kind of the same thing for this. So it makes it very hard to see on radar. And then again, because it's going Mach 8, it's going 10,000 kilometers per hour. You have no time to react once you do see it. But uh, here's popular science and they're kind of, you know, trying, you know, they're trying to kind of downplay the significance of Russia's hypersonic missiles. And they're saying that uh, the speed alone is not that important. It really would be the ability of a Zircon missile to be able to maneuver, especially, you know, end game maneuverability right before it hits a target. Is it able to move in an unpredictable manner that would make it harder to intercept, you know, to throw up a defense before, before it reached its target? So that's kind of the issue that this popular science article is trying to raise. And um, before I get on to this, this next uh, our, uh, this is a report basically put out by the Rand Corporation, and it's kind of um, it's kind of a indicator of just how you know in the media they might try to downplay everything Russia does. But then this Rand Corporation report, over a hundred pages long, is kind of uh, airing out some of the fears the West actually does have about these hypersonic missiles. Now think about it, you have one ship that has multiple missiles on it. It can launch those missiles all at the same time. And then you'd have multiple ships launching these missiles. If you had like 40 or 80 missiles coming in at a US carrier group, the chances of them detecting all of these missiles and being able to intercept them, especially if they're coming in from all different angles and in rapid succession, the chances of them shooting every single one of them down is highly, highly unlikely if not entirely impossible. And that's probably why you see reports like this out of the RAND Corporation, hypersonic missile nonproliferation, hindering the spread of a new class of weapon. Now it's 130 something pages long, and I'm not gonna read out of it. 
I'm going to write an article about this. And when it's posted, I'll include it in the, the I'll pin a comment to the top and you could read that article. And I'll take some key takeaways from it, quotes, and, and put it into the article. But this is about how uh, the U.S. is kind of worried about these missiles, you know, not just because they hinder aggression and military pressure the U.S. wants to put on countries like Russia and China developing these, but they're also worried about Russia and China selling these missiles to other countries. Could you imagine if Iran had, you know, a hundred of these missiles? Uh, the, the ability for the U.S. to bully Iran militarily, to threaten Iran militarily, would be significantly reduced. You know, you don't need to have nuclear weapons if you have something like this. It's a conventional weapon. Its use is, uh, you know, the political cost of using a weapon like this is so much lower than using nuclear weapons, obviously. It's just a missile. This just goes really, really fast. And if the U.S. is attacking Iran and Iran deploys these missiles against a country openly uh, carrying out aggression against it, I don't think the world would be that sympathetic to the U.S. if Iran managed to sink aircraft carriers and ships thousands of miles away from their ports back in the U.S. I don't think the world would be very sympathetic toward the U.S. in that case. And this is a, a credible deterrent that these countries would have against U.S. military aggression. And, you know, one last thing that I want to kind of close out on is we can already see a scenario like this developing with Russian air defense systems. So you have the S-300. The Russians themselves have S-400 and they're developing S-500 systems. The S-300 is being deployed right now by Syria to protect Syrian airspace. And it has created a, a, a noticeable deterrent against U.S. and Israeli aggression. When Israel wants to carry out a strike against Syria, they do this thing where they come very close to Syrian airspace or they just barely enter it. They launch these missiles, these long range missiles, and then they and then they leave. And then those missiles go on to their targets. And these missiles can be intercepted by the S-300, not, you know, not with 100 percent reliability, but uh, one, it's keeping these warplanes at a distance. And it's, you know, causing them to rely on these uh, only partially effective long range missiles. And so, you know, like uh, you've probably heard that an air, an air campaign alone cannot win a war. And if you're doing an air campaign at such a, you know, arm's length distance away from your enemy, it's even less effective. So Israel can kind of humiliate Syria with these missile attacks and, and try to provoke Syria. But they have absolutely no way at all of changing the, the situation on the ground in Syria and the fact that Syria is, is winning this, this proxy war being waged against it. And the same goes for U.S. air power in Syria. They don't want to test the S-300 air defense system. They don't want Syria to shoot down a U.S. warplane because it would be humiliating and it would further chip away at this uh, illusion of U.S. military invincibility that They've cre that they had previously had and has been eroding ever since. And so this use of these S-300 air defense systems, uh, again, what it's doing is it's creating this balance of military power around the globe. It's raising the cost of military aggression for the U.S. so high that the only option left for the U.S. You know, in, the, in the years to come will be to, to start working constructively with nations rather than using military force to try to stand above all these other nations. So that's what multipolarism is all about. It's about, you know, creating this balance of power. If, if everyone at the table, they're all afraid of, uh, you know, using violence against the other because they're worried that that person can successfully defend themselves, then they'll be more inclined to just do business with that person instead. So it's not really you know, hoping that uh, the people in Washington or on Wall Street have a change of heart and just become good people suddenly is kind of leaving them with no choice whatsoever. It's kind of like in a game of chess where you set the you set your pieces up in such a way that your opponent only has certain moves that they can make and certain moves you want them to make rather than having free reign over the board against you. And, um, you know, maybe one more thing. 
between these hypersonic missiles and air defense systems like Russia's more advanced S-400 and S-500 systems, they're, they're not going to be using these on the battlefield on a regular basis. The whole point of having them is so that no one really knows their full capabilities. Uh, some people are frustrated that Russia doesn't use its S-400 to protect Syrian airspace. But the, the thing is, once you turn it on and use it, the enemy knows is going to know how it works. They're going to be able to collect signals from it, analyze that, and start developing ways to, to circumvent those defenses. So that's why they kind of hold that in reserve. They want to use it if things really escalate and it's a very situ serious situation. That's when they'll switch it on and use it. And then the first time they use it, it'll be highly effective. Uh, the, the, their opponents will not know what it, it can, can and cannot do. And the same goes for these hypersonic missiles. So. And, and that's a problem the U.S. has had because think back to the original Gulf War when the U.S. first used its stealth fighters, laser-guided missiles and uh, bombs and everything else. They hadn't ever used these before and it took everyone by such surprise. And that was why the U.S. had such overwhelming military success against Iraq back in the 1990s. Now, ever since, they've been using these weapons everywhere all the time. Everyone can see how they work, and everyone can start working on ways to defend against them. And this has been working against the U.S. ever since. And this is the problem with being uh, an aggressor around the globe. This is the sort of situation you kind of paint yourself into the corner with. So anyway, that's the, that's the podcast today. Um, for my patrons that make it possible, thank you very much. And if you're watching this when I post it publicly, think about liking and sharing the video. Think about subscribing to my channel on YouTube because that helps a lot, helps the channel grow and I appreciate that. And to everyone that's been helping me in any way, liking, sharing, contributing, one-time contributions or supporting me on Patreon, uh, I appreciate it so much. And as always, thank you very much for watching.